So today's screen recording is going to look at my favorite market structure, which is oligopoly. Oligopoly is called an imperfectly, com imperfectly competitive market, or it's imperfect competition. And what we mean by imperfect competition are the market structures that fall somewhere between perfect competition and monopoly, pure monopoly, right? Imperfect competition includes firms that have competitors but are not price takers. So they have competitors, but they're not, in fact, forced to take the market price. They exercise at least some control over the price of the product that they're selling. Now, there are two different types of imperfect competition. There's oligopoly, which falls closer to monopoly, where you have only a few sellers selling similar products, and monopolistic competition, where you have many sellers. Monopolistic competition really falls much, much closer to perfect competition. So we can kind of look at it like this. Number of firms, one, we're looking at a monopoly. Few firms is an oligopoly. Many firms, we can either have products that are different and monopolistic competition or products that are similar or identical and perfect competition. Now, when you have only a few sellers, the key feature is the tension that exists between competition and self-interest, or cooperation and self-interest, right? So are the firms better off trying to act in concert with one another, act together, or are they better off trying to do what's best for themselves? So the characteristics of an oligopoly are you have a few firms selling similar products that are interdependent. What that means is the actions of one firm affects the profits of the other firm. Kind of my favorite example of this, Coke and Pepsi. Okay, so if Coke were to slash prices, that's going to affect Pepsi's bottom line. Okay, in an oligopoly, the firms are best off cooperating, trying to act like a monopolist. However, there's always going to be an incentive for them to not cooperate. Now, a duopoly is a special type of oligopoly where you only have two members. And we're going to use kind of a hypothetical example of a duopoly. Uh, the duopoly is going to be Jack and Jill. Okay. And Jack and Jill are the two suppliers of a town's water. Now, the marginal cost of production is going to be zero, zero dollars. Okay. Now, if one person controlled this market, if it was a monopoly, we would expect 60 gallons of water to be produced, sold for $60, giving a total revenue of $3,600. By contrast, if this were a competitive market and firms could freely enter and exit the market at will, firms would probably enter until profit was driven to zero. 120 gallons would be produced, economic profit would end up zero. The oligopoly is gonna end up somewhere in between these two outcomes. The monopoly outcome, where 60 gallons are produced, or the competitive outcome, where 120 gallons are produced. Okay, So in a competitive market, firms will produce where price equals marginal cost, 120 gallons will be produced, profits will be zero. Okay, uh, In a monopoly, because the firm is a price maker, they would produce 60 gallons, sell it for $60, and they would produce 3600 uh, they would get $3600 in profit. Now, in a duopoly, the socially efficient quantity of water, the quantity of water that would maximize surplus is 120 gallons. But a monopolists are going to produce only 60 gallons. So the outcome we would expect is going to be somewhere in between the two, and that's going to look kind of like this. So here's my marginal cost it's constant at zero dollars. There's my firm's demand curve. Their marginal revenue is below demand. The monopolist is going to produce at this point right here, where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. They're going to mark up and they're going to earn positive economic profit. Okay. The competitive firm would produce at this point right here, where price equals marginal cost. Okay, and they would earn zero economic profit. Whoops. The oligopoly 
is going to wind up somewhere in here between the monopoly outcome and the competitive outcome. And the basic rule is the more firms in the market, the closer the quantity will be to competition. The fewer firms in the market, the closer the quantity will be to a monopoly. So in a duopoly, the outcome will be much closer to a monopoly than an oligopoly with, say, six to eight firms in it. Now, duopolis might attempt to try to agree on a monopoly outcome. Um, there's a couple of different ways they can do this. They could enter into a price-fixing agreement. They could try to collude with one another, which is often an informal agreement about how, how much to produce and what prices to charge. Or they might even try to form a formal organization called a cartel. Now, in America, cartels are illegal. They are legal in other countries. There is one very important cartel known as OPEC. I know we've talked about them in class before. That is the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. They're responsible for maintaining the price of gasoline, or price of oil, and then indirectly the price of gasoline. However, even OPEC has a hard time acting in unison. So it's a formal organization, but even they struggle to act in unison. So although oligopolis would like to form cartels, uh, it's often not possible. In America, as I said, uh, collusion and cartels are illegal due to antitrust law. So those antitrust laws we talked about in Monopoly also apply to oligopolies. So when firms will choose how much to produce, uh, what they're going to look to do is maximize their profit. And they're going to wind up producing a quantity somewhat greater than the level produced by a monopoly, and less than the level produced by competition. So some possible outcomes, uh, joint output would be greater than monopoly, prices will be lower than monopoly prices, and profits will be less than monopoly profit. And the reason that this ends up happening, oh, check that, uh, and as the number of sellers in an oligopoly grows larger, the oligopoly starts to look more and more like competition and the price starts to get lower and approach the marginal cost of production. And the reason that this happens is because oligopolies really are strategic, okay? And when we study oligopolies, what we're really studying is a field of applied mathematics called game theory. Game theory is the study of how people behave in strategic situations. A strategic situation is a situation where one player's actions impact um, or will affect the way the other player plays the game. Kind of the most simple example of game theory is tic-tac-toe. Okay, so let's imagine I'm two players. Okay, if I'm playing tic-tac-toe and I put an X here, the O player has to consider where the X player's next play is going to be. So the O player will often take the middle spot trying to block the X player up. The X player might choose to go across here, or maybe the O player will go here, and so on and so forth, and you end up in a game that ends up being a tie. Okay. However, as a player of tic-tac-toe, I can't just decide where I want to play regardless of the other player. So a lot of games are strategic. Uh, chess is a very strategic game. Even football is a very strategic game when it comes to calling plays and the offense tries to read how the defense is aligned and the defense tries to read how the offense is aligned. Very strategic uh, decision making. Okay, And because the number of firms in an oligopoly is small, each firm has to act strategically. They can't just think about what their actions are going to be they have to consider what their competitors are going to do. Because each firm knows its profits depend not just on how much they produce, but also on how much their competitors produce. And there's a very simple strategic game that we can uh, use to demonstrate how this works, how we play this. And it's called the Prisoner's Dilemma. Um, this is a very old game. Uh, the basic premise is you catch two prisoners, okay? The uh, prisoners are both on parole. You catch them with a gun and you think they've committed an armed robbery. If 
you get one of the prisoners to confess, you can lock the other prisoner up for a longer period of time. But if the prisoners cooperate, they're going to not be locked up. And the way you play the prisoner's dilemma is like this. Okay, so it's a game between two craft captured prisoners. Uh, we have Bonnie and Clyde, and they both have some decisions to make. So let's look at it from Bonnie's point of view. Bonnie can either choose to confess, that would be this row here, or she could remain silent, which would be this row here. However, before Bonnie decides what to do, she has to think in terms of what Clyde is going to do. Clyde could either choose to confess, which would be this row here, or remain silent, which would be this row here. So if Clyde chooses to confess, Bonnie could either confess and get eight years or remain silent and get 20. Bonnie's best play is going to be to confess. If Clyde decides to remain silent, Bonnie could confess and go free or remain silent and get a year. Her best play is going to be to confess. So no matter what, Bonnie is better off confessing. If Clyde confesses, she gets a lower penalty. If Clyde remains silent, she gets a lower penalty. Her best play is to confess. Bon uh, Clyde has to think in terms of what Bonnie's going to do. If Bonnie chooses to confess, Clyde could either confess and get eight years or remain silent and get 20. His best play is going to be to confess. If Bonnie chooses to remain silent, that's going to be this row right here, Clyde could either choose to confess and go free or remain silent and get a year. His best play is going to be to confess. So regardless of what Bonnie chooses to do, Clyde is better off confessing. Now, this is called your dominant strategy, your best play regardless of what the other player chooses to do. And if you notice, Bonnie's better off confessing, Clyde is better off confessing, chances are they're both going to end up confessing and getting eight years in prison. Now, had they have cooperated, they could end up down here, okay, getting the monopoly outcome, going free after a year. However, because there's an incentive to betray, let's say Bonnie talks Clyde into cooperating and remaining silent, okay? Well, if Clyde remains silent, Bonnie could then confess and go free. There's an incentive to betray, and if you know the other player has an incentive to betray, you can't trust them. So the, the uh, Jack and Jill example from earlier is a lot like a prisoner's dilemma. So we have Jack and Jill deciding how much to produce. This represents their demand schedule. Now, I could actually turn their demand schedule into a prisoner's dilemma. And it's going to look like this, okay? So Jack could produce high. He could produce 40 gallons, and Jill could produce 40 gallons. That would be in this box right here. That means 80 gallons would be produced. Jill could produce 40 gallons, and Jack could produce 30. That would be 70. Jack could produce 40, and Jill would produce 30. That would be 70 right here. And then Jill and Jack could both cooperate and produce 30. That would be down here. Now, what would happen then is they would actually split the profits and the price would change. So let me kind of show you. If they produce 30 gallons each, that's 60 gallons. Whoops. Profit would be 3,600. They'd get 1,800 each. If they produce 70 gallons, the price goes down to 50 and the profit would be split. If they produce 40 gallons each, the price would drop to 40 and they would split 3,200 in profit. So what it would look like once you build your Punnett square is this. Okay. And once we've created our Punnett square, we could go out and play the prisoner's dilemma. So if I want to look at it from Jack's point of view, I have to think in terms of what Jill's going to do. Jill can produce 40 gallons. If she does, Jack could produce 40 and get 1,600 in profit, or he could produce 30 and get 1,500 in profit. His best play is to produce 40. If Jill produces 30 gallons, Jack could produce 40 and get 2,000, or he could produce 30 and get 1,800. His best play is to produce 40. So no matter what, Jack's dominant strategy is to produce 40 gallons. Now, let's look at it from Jill's perspective. If Jack produces 40 gallons, she could produce 40 gallons and get 1,600 in profit, or 30 gallons and get 1,500. Her best play is to produce 
40 gallons. If Jack produces 30 gallons, she could produce 40 gallons and get 2,000, or 30 gallons and get 1,800. Her best play is again to produce 40 gallons, and her dominant strategy is to produce 40 gallons. Okay, so regardless of what the other player does, they're both better off producing 40 gallons. Now, if they could cooperate with one another, they could actually end up splitting more money. However, the problem is there's not really an incentive, excuse me, for them to cooperate. Now, a dominant strategy is a player's best play regardless of the strategies other players play, other players have. Now, you won't always find a dominant strategy. Oftentimes there is, but it's not 100% guaranteed. However, cooperation is often difficult to maintain because it's really not in players' best interest, right? It's really not in the oligopolist's best interest to cooperate with one another. Now, there are a couple of other prisoner's dilemma in your note packet. I actually want you to play those on your own and see what strategies you come up with. A Nash equilibrium is the situation that happens when every player plays their dominant strategy. When every player plays the best strategy they can, regardless of what the other players play. So for example, in my Jack and Jill example, the Nash equilibrium would be up here at 40 gallons. Now, you will not always necessarily find a Nash equilibrium. Uh, in order for there to be a Nash equilibrium, there has to be a dominant strategy. You'll usually find a Nash equilibrium, but it's not a guarantee. So oligopolies are a lot like prisoner's dilemma in that self-interest makes cooperation difficult to maintain. It's hard for firms to cooperate when you give them an incentive, you give them some extra profit to not cooperate. You can, however, sometimes ensure cooperation if firms care more about future profit than one-time profit. Okay, there are some good examples, uh, and there's a few examples in the textbook, of how you can ensure future, uh, future cooperation. And really kind of the key is, in order to really ensure cooperation, the game has to be repeated. So like Coke and Pepsi is a great example of this. Coke and Pepsi are duopolis really two firms dominate the marketplace however it's really against their interest to get into a price war with one another uh, they want to compete for market space but they don't want to compete by lowering their prices they don't want to slash their prices till the point where they drive one another out of business as a consequence what coke and pepsi do is they do some non-price competition instead now cooperation from a public policy standpoint is about as undesirable as monopolies are because production is too low and prices are too high. And as a consequence, antitrust laws, the Clayton Act and the Sherman Act, make it illegal for firms to actually formally cooperate with one another. Okay, So it's actually illegal, especially in America, for firms to cooperate with one another. There's an interesting little article in your textbook about a quote-unquote illegal phone call that I would recommend that you take a look at. Now there are some antitrust, uh, there are some oligopoly, there are some, excuse me, oligopoly strategies um, that might not be in restraint of trade that are sometimes accused of being in restraint of trade. Uh, those are going to be resale price maintenance, predatory pricing, and tying. I will actually spend a little bit of time in class going over what exactly these three strategies are. I would recommend that you take a couple of minutes and uh, look over that section of your textbook.